If you would, go ahead and go back to 1 John chapter 5, where we read earlier. I want to talk to you today about how to have assurance of eternal life. And I, before I begin, I just want to thank Pastor Leek and the elders for the opportunity to have this Navy FCA Sunday. I hope it's an encouragement to you. I want to thank this church for your continual and faithful support of our FCA ministry. I want to thank all of you who pray for me and for our athletes and for our coaches. And I want to thank our praise and worship team and for Daniel and Natalie sharing those testimonies this morning. I love my job. I have a dream job. And uh, to work with young people like this is such uh, a great honor to me. We had a F- uh, Navy FCA Sunday on September 15th of last year. I preached on John 3:16, the most famous words of the Son of God from the Apostle John, from the Gospel of John. That message was evangelistic in nature that preached that those who were here who did not know Christ would believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Today I'm preaching from 1 John, written again by the Apostle John, written to believers, written that you might have the assurance of eternal life. And that is my goal today, to preach to believers, to those of you who have believed in Christ, to help give assurance from the Word of God that you indeed have everlasting life. It's a very simple outline, a very practical message, and a very short message as well. Uh, I shared this outline in a very brief message here for a memorial service several months ago, and I was asked if I would share this message here on a Sunday, and, and that is what I'm doing today. So I want to read the text that we'll be looking at together, 1 John 5, 11 to 13. And the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life, And this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. I want to start out with a question this morning. How many of you here today have never, okay, key word there, have never seen my favorite movie of all time, the movie Hoosiers. Just raise your hand if you've never seen the Hoosiers. I just want to enjoy the disappointment for a moment. (laughs) Keep them up. Keep them up. I need to pray for you this week. So Desmond, have you seen it? So disappointing, man. Can't wait to have you over. Okay. Well, Coach Norman Dale, played by Gene Hackman, who's from Danville, Illinois, where I used to live and where Sally is from, was the coach of the Hickory Huskers, a small rural high school in Indiana. And he gets his team to the Indiana High School State Championship game. And they go up against the South Bend Central Bears, who are much taller and much more athletic than this small town of Hickory. And late in the second half, after trailing most of the game, Hickory comes back to tie the game behind their star player, Jimmy Chitwood. And the Huskers force a turnover And they have the ball with a chance to win the game and to win the state championship. Norman Dale calls timeout. He's a veteran coach and he draws up a play to win the game and decides that he's going to use his star, Jimmy Chitwood, as a decoy and he's going to have Merle take the final shot. Well, when this coach announces that to his players, they all hang their heads in disgust and in disappointment. And he looks at him and says, what's the matter with you guys? And no one says anything. And then finally, Jimmy Chitwood, the star who says hardly anything in the whole movie, says, I'll make it. And so coach says, okay. So draws up the play and Jimmy has absolute confidence and full assurance that he will make the final shot. And so he gets the ball at the top of the key and holds the ball there for about 30 seconds. And as the clock is winding down, he dribbles in, drives, takes the shot, nothing but net. Sorry, I gave away the ending, but you're not going to watch it anyway. So (laughs) Hickory wins the 1952 Indiana High School State Championship. It's based on a true story about Milan, Indiana, this small school that won the state championship in 1953. I love that final scene because Jimmy Chitwood had great confidence that he would make the final shot. And I thought about that, that wouldn't it be great if we could have that same confidence regarding salvation and eternal life, to know for sure that when we die, we are going to heaven, to have absolute confidence and full assurance? Well, we can. 
because the Bible tells us so. And so today I want to be an encouragement to you, hopefully, and look at five facts about eternal life so that you may know that you have eternal life. I'm thinking of our young people, especially as I preach this today. May the word of God go forth and find a place in each of our hearts. Number one, we see here in the text that eternal life is a gift from the Father. Eternal life is a gift from the Father. Verse 11, John says, and the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life. I love it. Very simple, very straightforward. Eternal life comes from God. It is a gift. It cannot be earned as as Natalie shared with us earlier, it cannot be worked for, it cannot be merited. As we heard earlier as well, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works so that no one may boast. And so if you are trying to earn eternal life, living a life of good works, trying to do enough good to please a holy and righteous God, I just love to say to you here, stop. Stop doing that. And I say that with all love because it cannot be done. Isaiah 64, 6 says that all of your good good deeds are like filthy rags. And so no amount of good works that you could ever do would please a holy God. He is perfect and demands absolute perfection. And as we think about religion in the world Every other world religion besides Christianity can be represented by a two-letter word, the word do. It's what you do to earn God's favor. It's what you do to gain eternal life. It is what you do to try to please God or to please the gods. Christianity, however, is represented by a four-letter word, the word done, D-O-N-E. And it's about what God has done for you through the person Of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. God sent his one and only son who has always existed, the eternal word, to leave the glory of heaven, to be born of a virgin, to put on flesh and grow up on this earth, to be tempted in every way that we are tempted, yet to live his life without sin. And he would go to the cross and die for everyone who would ever believe in him that they might be forgiven of their sin and have everlasting life. Salvation is of the Lord. It is a gift from the Father. Paul talks about this in his epistle to the church at Ephesus, Ephesians 1, verses 3 to 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and righteous before him. In love, he predestined us, to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. John says, this is the testimony, and this is God's testimony, and he has given us eternal life. Eternal life comes from God and not from man. And so we first see in this text that eternal life is a gift from the Father. Number two, we see that eternal life is found in the Son. Eternal life is found in the Son. Look at the latter part of verse 11. I'll read the whole verse. The testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Eternal life is found in the person of Jesus Christ. Again, who lived a perfect life, who died an atoning death in the place of sinners, who rose from the dead on the third day and ascended back to the Father in heaven where he is presently seated at the right hand of God, preparing a place for us and for all who are trusting in Christ and Christ alone. That was why John, the the son of Zebedee, the brother of James, the beloved disciple or the disciple that Jesus loved, wrote his gospel. In John 20, verse 31, we read, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. 
eternal life is found in a person and it is found in the person of Jesus Christ, the bread of life, the good shepherd, the door of the sheep, the resurrection and the life, the vine, the way, the truth, and the life. Eternal life is a gift from the Father. Secondly, eternal life is found in the Son. Thirdly, we see that eternal life is impossible apart from the Son. Eternal life is impossible apart from the Son. Look at verse 12. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. I consider myself to be a a simple person. I'm from Indiana, the great Midwest. We call it the Holy Land. One of the flyover states to you. And I'm a simple person, and I'm giving you a very simple and practical outline. And to me, this is the most simple verse in all of the Bible. Verse 12. If you have the Son, you have life. If you don't have the Son of God, you don't have life right? Son equals life, no son, no life. And I've been sharing this outline and this message for many years. I've I've shared it on numerous high school and college campuses at FCA huddle meetings. I've shared it with church youth groups. And when I have done so, I've asked those in attendance this question. At the beginning of my talk, I'll ask them, what percent chance do you believe you have of going to heaven? This is a fascinating question but the answers are even more fascinating. I get some really good answers. I've had kids before put 0%. They're like, I was here for the girls and for the food. I'm not going to heaven, okay? Love that honesty. And then you have kids that say 44%, 55%, 80%. And then there's a group of kids, I like to call them the radio station kids because they put (laughs) 95.9, 98.7, 99.5. They really do. My all-time favorite, this was in Fisher, Illinois, near Champaign-Urbana, and I was doing this talk, about 12 kids were there, and I collect them at the end just to see what their responses are, and he put 99.99 with a repeating bar over those nines. I mean, this kid was pretty sure he was going to heaven, but something kept him from saying, I'm 100% sure of eternal life. If you have Jesus, if you have repented and turned from your sins, if you have trusted in Jesus Christ by faith alone, if you are trusting in his finished work on the cross for your salvation, you have eternal life. If you do not have him, even if you've been to church all of your life and you grew up reading the Bible and you've gone to Awana and you've been a part of youth group and perhaps even a campus ministry like FCA, but you've never entrusted your life to Jesus Christ, you do not have eternal life. And you do not have eternal life, everlasting life. Jesus said in John 14, 6, that Natalie read earlier, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. When I was in seminary, I worked various jobs and my wife worked various jobs. We were trying to get done in a timely manner. I got out of there in three and a half years and A friend of mine named Lance Wallace, he was the athletic director at Grace Community School, which was on the campus at that time at Grace Community Church. And he said, Kirby, would you like to uh, coach junior high girls basketball? And I was like, no, no. I mean, that's not even on my radar. Like, why would anyone want to do that? (laughs) Sorry to any of you. I'm sorry to female athletes. It just wasn't something that it wasn't a spiritual gift or an interest in my life. And then he said, um, well, he kind of challenged me. He goes, well, Kirby, unless you really stink as a coach, they won the championship last year and they should win again if, if you're halfway good coach. Now I was a little interested. And then he said, I'll pay you $1,000. I said, where's the whistle? Where do I start? <laughs> and so I coached junior high girls basketball for one year. And uh, that was a school that was, went up through ninth grade, so seventh, eighth, and ninth. And I had already been teaching uh, PE a couple days a week at the school to, for a little extra money. And there were two sisters that one was in ninth and one was in eighth. And I'd watched them play basketball. And they had a, a sister who was a sixth grader. And I'd watched her too. And she was a really good, good ball handler. So I had all these girls try out. I had to invite all the sixth graders too because I, I wanted that girl to be my point guard. 
So 26 girls come to try out for basketball, and there's no way I was going to coach 26 girls, and we didn't have enough uniforms, so I let them try out for three days, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then at the end of the week, I brought them together. I said, thank you for trying out. Appreciate your hard work, but I can't keep you all, and so this is how it's going to go. On Monday morning, I'm going to put the final roster in the office. There's no really good way to do this, right? And so I said, if you're on the roster, you're on the team. If you're not on the roster, I'm sorry. And I give that simple illustration to remind you of this, that if you have the Son of God, you have life. You have life eternal, everlasting life. But if you do not have the Son, you do not have life. You do not have eternal life or everlasting life. If that is true of you, you are still dead in your sins and Your sins have separated you from God and you are on your way to an eternity in hell, separated from the love and the mercy and the grace of Almighty God. And so I would say to you, if if that is true of you today, trust him today. Today is the day of salvation. None of us are guaranteed tomorrow. Eternal life is a gift from the Father. Eternal life is found in the Son. Eternal life is impossible apart from the Son. Fourthly, Eternal life is accessed through faith. Eternal life is accessed through faith. Look at verse 13, the first part of that verse. John says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. Do you want to have the forgiveness of your sins? Do you want to have peace with a righteous and holy God? Do you want to have everlasting life? It's very clear that you have to believe on Jesus. In Acts chapter 16, we see that Paul and Silas are in prison and they are in chains. And while they are in prison, they are singing and worshiping God. And it's this beautiful scene as the other prisoners are listening to them. And suddenly we read there's a great earthquake and the foundations of the prison house were shaken. And immediately all the prison doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. And when the the jailer awoke and saw the prison doors were opened, supposing that all the prisoners had escaped, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself. He knew that if he let one prisoner escape, it would mean death to him, so he thought he would take care of it himself. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, do not harm yourself, we are all here. And this had an incredible effect on this jailer. He was so moved by this act of compassion, he called for the lights and he rushed into the prison cell and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas and said to them, what must I do to be saved? Well, that's the billion dollar question, isn't it? I used to say million, but inflation. So we say billion now. You know, Paul could have said a lot of things in answering that question. He could have said, hey, you can't be saved. I mean, you've been a jailer. You were torturing us. You have sinned too much and you have gone beyond the grace of God. Or he could have said, well, here's what you need to do. Make sure you do enough good works and make sure your good works outweigh your bad works. Or join the local church here in Philippi. That's what it means to be a Christian. But no, that's not what he said. He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household." Believe, place your faith in Jesus Christ, place your faith in Christ alone. The gospel, the good news is about believing in the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. I mentioned to you earlier, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works so that no one may boast. John 3, 16, again, the most famous words of Jesus, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. John 11, 25, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And then Paul in Romans 10, 9 to 10, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, 
resulting in salvation. A couple of those verses I quoted for you are from the book of John, the gospel of John that is also known as the gospel of belief because we see that word pastuo in the Greek 98 times in that great gospel. The word believe, believe. But it's more than just intellectual knowledge. It's more than just walking an aisle or praying a prayer or signing a card or getting baptized to please your mom and dad. It is about entrusting your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. In John chapter 2, verses 23 and 24, we read that when Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, observing his signs, which he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men. They were believing in him, but Jesus was not believing in them. It's the same Greek word. And he did not believe in them because he knew all men. They were only believing him because of the signs that he was doing. They were not trusting in him as the son of God. They were not giving their lives to him. And so he did not entrust himself to them. Eternal life is a gift from the father. It is found in the son. It is impossible apart from the son. It is accessed through faith. Fifthly, eternal life is a present reality. Eternal life is a present reality. Look again in verse 13. The last part, I'll read the whole verse again for context. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that, purpose here, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Friends, do you know this? God wants you to know that you have eternal life. You really can know that you know that you know. Today. Eternal life begins the moment that you place your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and in his finished work on the cross. My dad went to be with the Lord just over three years ago. And when I was young, he was on fire for the Lord and he loved to witness to others. We were a part of a Baptist church then and on Thursday nights, he would go calling, uh, cold calling to people's houses or people who had visited our church, and they would share the gospel with people all over our town. And I remember being with my dad in our, our small town in Indiana. We'd be walking around. It's a very small town, 2,700 people, and we would pass someone that he knew, and they would say something like, hey, what do you know, Eddie? His name was Ed. And my dad would go, well, I know I'm going to heaven. You talk about a conversation stopper <laughs> for someone who doesn't know Christ. Where do you go from there? How about that Cubs game? I mean, there's just nowhere to really go from that point. But my dad knew he was going to heaven because he was trusting in Jesus Christ. Just a few years before he died, he told us again, shared his testimony with us in tears and how the Lord had saved him and changed his heart and given him new life. He was not arrogant. He was not prideful. He was trusting in Jesus to get him to heaven. And he had complete assurance that when he died, that is where he would be. Friends, God doesn't want you to be 50% sure or even 98.7% sure. He wants you to be absolutely sure. And we can have absolute assurance because salvation is of the Lord. It's not of us. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.30, it is because of him, it is because of God that you are in Christ Jesus. Another tra translation says, it is by his doing that you are in Christ Jesus. Salvation is of the Lord. I love that phrase. We see it in the book of Jonah and it comes from the lips of the prophet Jonah. And I trust a man who spent three days and three nights in the belly of the fish. Sally and I lived in Los Angeles for three and a half years when I was attending seminary, and we really got spoiled with the weather there. I mean, if you know about Los Angeles, Southern California, it really doesn't rain from March to October. And the only reason that we watched the weather was to see how hot it was going to be that day. And uh, when was the fog going to burn off at the beach? Because that was pretty important. And we moved back to Indiana in 2002, and 
it rained a little more often there and it snowed some too. And so we had to start watching the weather again. And we would plan a trip to a state park or an amusement park or to a baseball game. And so we'd watch the weatherman and he would say, tomorrow there's a chance of showers or scattered showers, or there's a 40% chance of rain tomorrow. What does that mean? I just need to know, is it going to rain? Or is it not? I'm trying to plan a trip. Just tell me, sir. Can you imagine going up to someone and saying to them, can I tell you how you can have eternal life? But I'm only 40% sure of myself. I don't think you're going to be very convincing. John says, these things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know, that you may know that you have eternal life. God wants you to have absolute assurance of eternal life. He wants you to know that you know that you know. Amen? To have no doubt, to have no fear. I've shared some verses with you today that talk about eternal life, but I want to conclude by just giving you a few more For those of you that are here today and perhaps anyone that is listening online who know that you are trusting in Jesus Christ alone for salvation, you say, I have the son, you've entrusted your life to him, but you still have doubts and you struggle with the assurance of salvation. I know I struggled with that so much growing up. Listen to the promises of God that are found in the God-breathed, inerrant, and authoritative word of God. Romans 5.1, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 8.1, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8.38-39, for I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Galatians 2, 20, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me, and gave himself for me. Philippians 1, 6, for I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. And then John 5, 24, truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death into life. Whoever has place their faith in Christ, has eternal life right now. And John tells us under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that they will not come into judgment because he has crossed over from death to life and there's no going back. It's life and life eternal. Eternal life is a gift from the Father. Eternal life is found in the Son. Eternal life is impossible apart from the Son. Eternal life is accessed through faith, and eternal life is a present reality. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for the clarity of your word. I thank you for a passage like this, Lord, where there's no doubt. I thank you for a verse like 1 John 5, 12 that is so simple so clear. If we have the Son, we have life. If we don't have the Son of God, we do not have life. Lord, I thank you for everlasting life. I thank you for the forgiveness of sins. I thank you that salvation is of the Lord. I thank you that salvation is not up to us and our own striving, our own work, our own merit, but salvation is of the Lord. The Lord who made us alive when we were dead in our sins, by grace we have been saved. And it is an amazing, marvelous, magnificent grace. Lord, I would just pray for any believer here today, anyone listening online who is struggling with the assurance of their salvation. Lord, they know that they have trusted in you. They believed in you. They have 
place their faith in your finished work on the cross on their behalf. But Lord, because of sin, because of the flesh, because of the devil, because of the world, Lord, they doubt. And they sometimes struggle with the assurance of their own salvation. Lord, I pray by your spirit and through your word today, you would give them assurance. Lord, that we would have confidence that we have eternal life. And that, Lord, we can go to a lost and dying world with the hope of the gospel, the hope for sinners, that they too can be reconciled to a holy God. Thank you for assurance, Lord. There's nothing greater than knowing that you are bound for heaven and the best is yet to come. So we give you praise. We give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen.